Hi guys, welcome back to George Reads once again. Uh, today, um, me and my parents uh, finally decided that it was time for us to get out and have a little uh, walk with my aunt and the dogs at a safe distance, of course. It was all fine and it was so great to finally be out of the house getting some fresh air with the dogs, Jimmy and Dave and Bluebell. And it was um, really nice and uh, I really enjoyed it. And I hope you guys are staying safe, um, social distancing, washing your hands and um, staying home during the coronavirus pandemic. But yesterday we did two chapters and one night for the first time on my channel in, chapters n in chapter nine. Um, the some gentleman and the mother of Captain Chicken came to Jimbo's apartment, and Becky came with them. And no, Becky was there. She came to the flat and then rescued Jimbo from them. And now they're on their way to Scotland to save Charlie. And this is chapter eleven now. So let's get the show on the road. Chapter eleven: The Bad Step. On Sky, we stopped at Co-op for bread. Biscuits, lipstick, strawberry jam, and cheddar cheese. Becky took out her mobile phone and that she had no, and found out that she had no reception. We were now officially off the map. We headed into the hills. There was a village or two. There was a car or two, but mostly there were mountains: grass, locks, cattle, sheep, rock, and more mountains. It looked like the land that time forgot. And more. If you close your ears to the roar of the motor guzzy, you can imagine a broad saurus lumbering out of a valley between two cloudy peaks. I thought about the men in the expensive light grey suits. I thought about Mr Kidd and Mrs Pierce. And I simply couldn't connect any of them with this place. I began to wonder whether it was all a mistake, whether the map was just a map. A leftover from a holiday spent exploring Scottish castles. I began to wonder whether Charlie really was in Portugal. Or whether something worse had happened. The light began to fail. I was tired and I wanted to sleep, but I knew that I wouldn't be able to sleep. Not here. Not without seeing Charlie again. Eventually, the road curved off a hill and made its way onto the little fishing village of Elgor. Seeing houses on either side of the road, I felt less nervy. A bedroom light here, a flower garden there. It seemed almost normal. We turned the last corner and Becky brought the bike to a halt on this tiny stone jetty which cut into the water. An old man was standing on the jetty, tidying lobster pots and co coiling ropes. Beside him, his cocker spaniel was sitting quietly, panting and scratching its ear with its paw. Becky lifted her helmet and leant back to speak to me. That's the way, she said. She said, pointing her gloved hand along the coast. Now, let's go find somewhere to camp. The sky was purple and orange in the sunset. The mountains were silhouetteless, silhouettes, like jagged strips of torn black paper laid against the sky. I want to go now, I said with determination. Jimbo, you're barking mad, said Becky. It's eight miles. It's a rocky path. It's getting dark. You saw them in the flat, Becky, I said. They'll be following us. I know they will. We can't waste any time. We've got to help Charlie. I'm going, with or without you. All right, all right, she grumped, getting off the bike and helping me transfer our stuff from the panniers to the hodl. I'll come. Not that I've got any choice. Mum would murder me if I went back and said I lost you. You're a pal, I said, shaking her hand. I'm a moron, she replied. We just locked the bike, picked up the bag and started out for the footpath when we were greeted by the old man who'd been tending in the lobster pots. Evening, he said in a broad Scots accent. Evening. We replied suspiciously. Ah, city folk, he said, looking at my trainers and Becky's black nail polish. You'll be walking that get up. You'll no be walking in that get up, will you? With the night coming down. No, we're going to see a film, snapped Becky. She was always rather touchy about her get up. Yes, we're walking, I explained politely. I wanted to get away. I don't want to stand around chatting to strangers. The camera's right, or all the way to Koryask, he asked. Then, very slowly, he lifted his pipe to his mouth, so that the sleeve of his oil skin fell away to show a band on the left wrist. I stepped backwards. To Corius, said Betty curtly, so we ha so we hadn't got any time wits to chat him. I expected the old man to come and grab me by the scruff of the neck. I expected to see his fingers light up, but neither of these things happened. He smiled and chuckled. Will you enjoy yourselves, he said. It's going to be a nice pitch battle night for the walk along the cliff path. 
and with that he turned and walked back up the road, the cocker spaniel trotting at his heels. The wristband, I said to Becky. I saw it, she replied. They know we're here, I whispered, looking around to see if there was anyone within earshot, crouching behind a lobster pot or an unturned or upturned boat. Maybe, said Becky. Maybe it was just a brass wristband, Jimbo. Like people wear. Maybe we're getting paranoid. Maybe, I said. But I was right. I knew it. He was one of them. The way he showed us the wristband, the chuckle. On the other hand, if he was one of them, then we were on the right track. Chris was important. So why didn't he stop us? Perhaps he knew we wouldn't make it along the path in the dark. Perhaps he knew we would find nothing when we got there. Perhaps he knew there were others waiting to greet us at the far end, flexing their neon blue fingers in the windy dark. Well, said Betty, what are we waiting for? I fell into step behind her. We didn't need the torch. The lobster fisherman was wrong. The night was not pitch black. Ten minutes after we set off, threads of grey clouds dissolved to reveal a full moon suspended above the sea. It felt like walking through a scene from the son of Dracula, but at least we could see where to put our feet. A good job, too. The path was narrow and stony and cut in the the steep, scrubby cliff rising high above the water. We had to duck under our gnarled trunks, clamber over boulders and move fallen branches out of our way. The sea lay to our left like a great sheet of beaten silver. To our right, rocks, trees and bushes climbed up into the night sky. Out in the bay, out in the bay, an island floated like a great barnacled whale. Beyond it, the ocean, blackness and stars, everything looked mind-bogglingly big. I was lonely and frightened, even with Becky in front of me. If we tripped and fell, we'd be held to skelter down into icy water and be swept away. No one would even know. To make matters worse, my city folk trainers were not made for trekking, and I was getting a large and painful blister on my right heel. I stuffed the shoe with tissues, gritted my teeth, and marched manfully onwards. After two hours, we reached the Bay of Camisteri. The path dropped down and the cliff flattened out into a gentle sloping meadow of spiky grass. We crested a small ridge and the beach lay in front of us. We crossed a tiny stream and stepped into the field. Jeez, I says. Now that does my head in, echoed Becky. The field was full of rabbits. A hundred, two hundred... I'd never seen frightened of I've never been frightened of rabbits before. But this little gave me the creeps, sitting there with their powder puff tails and their spoony ears like some, something from a horror film called Rabbit. Let's keep going, I said. We began the second, more difficult section of the path. Except there wasn't much of a path anymore. There were rocks, nettles, fawns, trees and mud, and my blister was getting worse. After an hour of slipping, tripping, grumbling and hobbling, we came to an unexpected halt. In front of us lay a smooth, steep face of blank covered rock and patches of moss, like a giant granite nose. No mud, no branches, no clumps of grass, nothing. Staring up, starting high above our heads, it swooped down to a ragged edge hanging over the surface of the black water. The map called it the bad step. You could see what the map went. You first, I said. You're older. Thanks, Jimbo, Becky replied. You're a real gentleman. We couldn't go up and round, and we couldn't go down and over. And uh, the slope was just too steep. We had to go over. Becky shimmied. I shimmied up behind her. We lay face down on the rock, spread eagled like some bathing lizards, and shuffled gingerly sideways. We were doing it all right. My trainers were rubbish for walking, but the rubber soles stuck to the rock pretty well. Sadly, the moss didn't. I was halfway across when my when I put my front foot on a clump of the stuff, and as I shifted my weight, it tore away beneath me. I shot downward, broke only by my knees, my fingers, and the end of my nose. My heart stopped, and my feet slid over the bottom of the edge of space. I heard Becky scream and closed my eyes, waiting for the inevitable plunge through the air and onto the pointy rocks half submerged in the freezing water below. I came to a sudden halt. My legs dangling in the empty air. My fingers were jammed into a crack that ran across the surface of the stone. It was a narrow crack, and my fingers were hurting, and I wasn't going to be able to hang on for long. I tried to swing my legs up to the rock, but I was too far over. Jimbo! shouted Becky. Hang on! I looked up. 
She was shifting her weight slowly down her the giant nose towards me, with the holder looped over her shoulder. There's a crack, I said, and at the moment one of my hands slipped free and I screamed. The toe of Becky's boot found the crack. She took the holder off her shoulder and lowered it down to me. Grab this! I grabbed it. Now pull! She pulled. I pulled. The handle stretched horribly. I swam my right leg. Once, twice, three times. Finally, I got it over the lip of the rock. I heaved again and pulled. She heaved again, and I got my other foot over the lip and lay flat against the rope, panting. Crikey, Jimbo, she said. Don't do that to me again. Ever. We waited until we'd got our breath back. Then we started shuffling sideways with our toes on, in the crack. We rounded the curve of the rock and were able to grab a gnarly root and swing ourselves onto the safety of the damp earth. Holy hot dogs, Batman, said Becky. That was a close call. I put my head to my face and realised that my nose was bleeding where I'd use it as a brake pad. Well, she said, you don't get this kind of assignment at school, don't you? Corius caught us by surprise. The path led down to a sea level where we found our way blocked by a little channel leading to the shore. We turned and followed the channel inland. We crossed over a rocky hump and lock loomed into view. Several billion gallons of cold dark water stretching away in front of us. Corius, said Becky, standing on the rocky hump like someone who just climbed Mount Everest. We did it, kiddo. Around the lock on every side of the Coolian Hills rose into the night. The central strip of water shone blue in the moonlight, but the distant peak banks vanished in the scot soot black shadows of the peaks. High above us, plumes and mist were forming in the very tips of the mountains and trailing off into the star filled sky. The sea had seemed big, stretching out to the dark horizon, but the size of the silhouetted mountains made the lock seem even bigger, and the sound of water lapping against rock. The silence was complete. There were waves on the sea. The water here was as smooth as motionless as mercury. This was not a place where human beings were meant to be after dark. So, said Becky, where do we, so what do we do for our next trek? I thought about Charlie. I don't know. I could feel tears pricking at the corner of my eyes. We spent the last two days getting to this place. We'd risk our lives at least twice. I didn't know what I was expecting to find when we got here, but I expected to find something at least. And this was the emptiest place I'd seen in my entire life. Chain up, said Becky. Let's fix ourselves some dinner. We trudged along the edge of the channel, crossed over using a series of stepping stones and looked for a good camping spot. En route, we found the ruins of an old cottage for a few, and that for a few seconds looked as if it might offer some kind of clue as to why Corius was so important. But it was just a ruin. Four crumbling walls, a doorway, two window holes, a mud floor. We climbed up to a flat area of grass, neatly protected from prying eyes and the growing wind by a large oval boulder. Becky erected the tent behind the big stone. I got out some plasters and antiseptic wipes and salvon and did first aid on my heel and nose. Once we were snugged up into our sleeping bags, we broke out the bread and cheese. We f well fed and foot sore, we lay on our backs looking up at the stars through the open tent flap. Becky jammed her iPod earphones and listened to some evil corpse, or gangrenous limb, or dead puppy, or whatever else she downloaded recently. I tried to remember the names of the constellations. The Blair, the Plough, Orion. Finally, I zipped up the tin, pulled the sleeping bag round my neck and closed my eyes. Uh, 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 moaned Becky tunelessly. Then she stopped. She took one of the earpieces out of her ear, shook it, stuck it back in again and tore it out again. I could hear a strange bubbling noise coming out of the tiny white speaker. It's broken, she snapped. Again? Your watch, I gasped. Look at your watch. She looked at her watch. The face had lit up and the hand was spinning backwards. Ouch, she yelled, ripping off her wrist. It's hot. Somewhere inside the holder, the torch was turning on and off. Two seconds later, the whole tent was bathed in a brilliant blue light. And that's the end of chapter 11. Thank you guys for watching uh, chapter 11. Um, I know it's uncertain times right now, but we've got to keep going and fight COVID-19. So thank you for watching and goodbye.